Welcome everyone. This is Robin Duncan with our Course in Miracles church service. Our topic today is God, please help me. I have been in that situation so many times. And I have to say that every single time I go to God, I do get through my situation. I don't look back and say, well, that was terrible. You know, <laughs> something happens to make it okay. Sometimes miraculous, sometimes greater than I could possibly imagine. I think all of those outcomes depend a little bit about what we're expecting, what we're welcoming, what we're allowing to happen. You know, instantaneous healing is always a great target, right? To have that instantaneous healing. But do we, in our mind, welcome that kind of healing? And I think that we get better at doing that as we practice these principles of A Course in Miracles. So let's go ahead and get started with an opening prayer. Dear God, we join here today receiving your word, your love, your clarity, reminding ourselves that we are not in charge of the answers or any of the details, really. Today, we bring to you whatever it is that we are carrying on our shoulders or in our hearts, that you would wash us clean, that you would show us a straight path, that you would help us to understand that we have nothing to fear. Sometimes we forget we need those gentle, firm reminders. So thank you for walking with us in everything we do. And as we listen to only your voice, we are learning that that is the key to ensure a peaceful, happy outcome for everyone involved and beyond. May your will be done. Amen. Today, as we look at this topic of God, please help me. You know, sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where we just have no idea what to do. I think it's worse, actually, when we think we know what we're going to do. <laughs> I think it's even harder to get out of the way. So let's say that you've got a situation in front of you, and it might be somewhat unfamiliar, but maybe you've seen other people go through it, or you've heard about what other people did, and you start drawing on the library of the past. That's what I call the, the place between our ears, the library of the past. We kind of go through our Rolodex of, you know, see some people, the younger generation may not even know what a Rolodex is. But anyway, that's a circular thing that has like everybody's name and phone number on it. And, and you go flipping through it, looking for something. We have that kind of in our mind between our ears. And when we're faced with something we don't understand or don't know how to respond, we start going through that Rolodex of the past. And we're looking for what do I do? Oh, I know, you know, I I heard a friend do this, or I saw this on television, or, you know, what about this over here? And we start drawing from the library of the past between our ears, and it doesn't always go so well. In fact, when we draw from the library of the past, we are almost guaranteed for it to not go well, because if we are in the same problem or something similar again, it's probably a pattern repeat, which means that it probably didn't go so well before. So before you go digging for the answer that you had before that didn't work then, and you're trying to apply that now, we want to pause, hit that pause button in your mind. And we need to go up before we go out, go up before we go out. We need to pause and make room for God in any moment there's a place within you that has every answer. You may not be used to getting in touch with that. You may not be used to asking for that or asking for help from that, but it's a fact. Every answer is with you right now that will lead you to safety, lead you out of harm's way. And we have to ask, and then that part of our mind that is answering our God intelligence, you know, through God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus himself, our heavenly team, I think even a, a grandmother in spirit, a grandfather, they can answer too. They all are tapped into that. We know what's going on here and we know how to help you library. <laughs> we may not have that same 
understanding between our ears, but there is a place within us that has that understanding. And so when something happens for you, if you could teach yourself this today, say to yourself, I do not know how to respond to this. I cannot know the best way to respond to this, but I will step back and let the one who knows this answer respond for me. You know, it's almost like we're walking around holding God's hand all the time, just holding his hand. And, and in any situation we can say, what do you think about this? What do you think we, we should do? I love to say we instead of I. What do you think we should do? <laughs> we have a team here. Call on that presence to help you. And the more that you accept that you are not the answer person, that you are not the one to provide the solution, the details, the way out of this, the more you will hear God's voice. But you actually have to practice not being the answer person and for somebody like me, that was really hard. That was probably one of the hardest things for me. You know, I have a very strong left brain, as you can probably tell. I was a CFO, a CPA, you know, planning, forecasting. If I didn't do those things and anticipate disaster or reserves for something terrible to happen, I would have been fired if I didn't do my job. So I had to actually come to terms with this idea that a healed mind doesn't plan and that doesn't mean that as a CFO that I shouldn't do my planning or my forecasting. I think it's to understand that we start with prayer, then we do the budgeting and forecasting. We ask in prayer all along the way and we finish with prayer. And then your budgets and forecasts are probably going to be spot on. We are not alone in what we do. And I'm never telling you don't do your job or, you know, say, well, you know, I'm not a body, so I don't have to do that forecast. Well, probably won't have a job very long, but we can walk with God in everything we do. And honestly, I wish I had known that then because I put so much on my shoulders that I couldn't even turn my head right to left without like cortisone treatments in my neck from my chiropractor. I was under so much stress that, um, I prayed to God. I loved God, but I always went to myself first for answers, not out of arrogance. I don't think, however, my ego would probably say that, yes, that you're, you think you're the one, but I think we're taught to believe we're the one to provide the answer. And the more I learned that I am not the one, not only am I not the one, but I cannot be the one. Like, you know, our friend Ann, she just came on here today and, you know, do I know what's going to happen for Ann today? Nope, I don't know. Do I know what happened for her yesterday? No, I don't know. Do I know what's going to happen for her 10 years now from now, 20 years from now? Nope, I don't know. Now I can pray with her. I can listen with her, but I don't know any of those details. And I cannot know really, because from my vantage point, it's just not something that I, at least as of yet have access to. So if I start trying to decide or assemble a plan or a thought that would involve her, the likelihood that I would be wrong is very high because we don't know these answers, but there is a place within us right now that has every answer. There's a part of my mind right now and Anne's mind, both of our minds joined as one that knows every single one of those answers. So before, if Anne is deciding to move or if she's deciding to go into a new friendship, before she does those things, it would really be great if she would just pause and say, God, what do you think about this? Is this a good decision for me? Is this what you would have me do? Where would you have me go? You know, I like this little house over here and it's a little smaller and it looks like something I could keep up a little bit better. You know, what would, is that where you would have me be? Would that be a happy place for me? Just ask. Some people might say, well, I, I do ask, but I don't hear anything. When we get answers, it comes in so many forms. And sometimes we think when we see something on a billboard that that's not from God. If it's from God, it's going to go right through you. Like you'll look at a billboard. It might be your answer. You might hear a song playing on the radio that says, it's time to move. It's time to move. <laughs> it's time to move. And, you know, Anne might get her answer that way or Listen for answers. 
the thing is that God will reach you in a way that you understand. So you can plan on that. You can relax about that. Might come into a dream, give you an answer from my mother. God bless her sweet soul in heaven. She would get dreams where God would talk to her directly. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm the heir to that woman. How come I don't get those dreams? You know, <laughs> that's a really cool dream. But he would actually answer her in her dream. And we get answers many ways. It might be a friend putting a book in your hands and you may think, well, a lot of things happen. How do I know the difference? Number one is it's going to feel peaceful. It's going to feel calm or more calm than it did before. You're going to feel a little bit of reassurance around the guidance that you're receiving. And then if you're, you think you're hearing something, but you're not sure, ask again, you know, God, I'm getting this nudge that what you're saying is I should do this, not that. Can I have clarity around that? Watch for that clarity. You'll get clarity. Sometimes let's say you're choosing between two jobs. Let's say, you know, they both look good. This one pays a little more. This one's a little closer to home. I don't know what to do. And then when you say, God, can you give me some clarity? And then you call to check on both positions. And that one just got taken out. Somebody else got hired. Praise the Lord. Like, just thank you, God, that you gave me this very clear answer. A door closing is so good because it means another door is the right door. I like it when I see a closed door because then I know that's not it, right? If you have five doors in front of you, isn't it nice if four of them close so you can see the one that's still open? That's kind of where we are when we're looking at a situation. Be glad for those closed doors. Praise God for them and, and thank God for being very clear with you and, and really wish whoever got that job well because it's going to be perfect for them. Everyone's included. You know, today, my message from the heart is a miracle story that I call Gina's thumb many years ago, many, many years ago now, but I had my two sons at home and I had come out of my own divorce. So I was still reeling from that. So were they, but all of a sudden there was this opportunity that was given me to welcome my two little cousins into my home. So my boys, I think were around eight and 10 and the girls Two girls, sisters, they were probably 12 and 13, somewhere in there. So they were, one was in elementary school, still maybe sixth grade. And then in the other one was in middle school. So now here I am, you know, the, the lady in the shoe with all the kids, isn't that her? I don't know. <laughs> it was me with my kids and I just loved it. And I loved mothering. And so all of a sudden these girls were with us. And I didn't know much about girls other than being one. I hadn't raised one before. <laughs> so there was a whole new list of, you know, girls like to have lots of accessories. You know, my boys would be glad with one or two pairs of shoes. And even if I bought them more shoes, they probably wouldn't have paid attention. But, you know, girls, they like the shoes and the hair things and the, you know, and it was so much fun because it was very different. And so I'm doing the best I can with my two beautiful cousins. And it hadn't been very long that they had been living with us. And I had just gotten a little medical card for the two of them. Hadn't really studied it yet. I just got it in the mail, threw it in my purse. Didn't really even know what it said yet, but I had heard I was getting a medical card. So if something happened, I would know where to take them. And so it wasn't my wallet, thank goodness. But I had just dropped off the girls at their schools. And then I made my way across town to where the boys went. And that's about a 20 minute drive. And then another 20 minutes back, I'm on my way back to the house and also facing the, the middle school. And as I'm driving along in the car, the phone rings and it's a woman from Gina's school. She's one of the middle schoolers. And the woman sounded a little strange. And she said, you know, you need to come back to the school. And I said, oh, okay, did Gina forget something? You know, very casual. No, uh, she, she had an injury, but it would be great if you would just come back to the school and pick her up. I go, is she okay? And she said, oh um, yeah, you just need to come and pick her up. And I said, okay, that was just so odd, you know, that how could she, I mean, she'd only been there, what, 45 minutes maybe. And I thought, how could she injure herself that she needs to be picked up? Just kind of pausing, but I'm praying already already just saying, God, you know, my goal is peace for all of this. Don't know what's going on, but 
you know, thank you for support. Thank you for showing us what to do, whatever needs to happen. So I get up to this school. Now the office is kind of out closer to the curb. So there's no parking in front of the office. There's just sidewalk and trees. And as I get close to the school, there's a group of people standing out front and they're waving to me and I'm kind of like, hi, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Right. And they're going like this. And I, and I rolled down my window and they said, back up. And I go back up. What do you mean back up? Like over the curb. And they said, yeah, they wanted me to back up over the curb to the front doors of the administration building. I'm like, why would I do that? I mean, I don't really understand. And all of a sudden the doors blow open. Here comes Gina in a wheelchair. And to this day, I don't know why they didn't call an ambulance. I think they really should have, but my mind was so in a state of confusion about what was going on. It, it, I didn't even say, you know, why didn't you call an ambulance? I didn't know what was going on. She comes out in a, a wheelchair. She is screaming her head off. And I said, what happened? And then one of the administrators steps over, whispers in my ear and says, she cut her thumb in woodshop. And, um, and so she needs to go to the hospital. And so right there, you know, she should have gone in an ambulance, my goodness. And then she, she hands me something. And I said, what's that? And she said, it's the tip of her thumb and it's in a cup on ice. And I'm like, holy moly, you know, <laughs> Jeez. And, and she said, she doesn't know. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. So I've got her in my front seat, screaming her head off. Now, fortunately too, for, for Gina and her sister, we had been talking about A Course in Miracles. This was back in the days when I was really learning those basic principles. And so the girls knew about prayer. They knew about choosing peace. You know, we hadn't gotten too much further. And so I've got this cup and I put it down between the seats, you know, in a nice stable place next to my uh, emergency brake. I think it stabilized it. And I am just freaked out. You know, the, I... I didn't expect any of this. I am able to look calm when I'm freaked out, but I was really freaked out. And so we're driving and I realize I have no idea where to take her. And then I'm thinking it's probably on that card. I have her card, but it was such an emergency. I mean, she's got this big thing wrapped around her hand and you could see the blood coming through. I mean, it was just such a mess. And so I said to Gina, I go, Gina, can can we pray about this? And she said, yes, <laughs> never heard her say it was so loud. Yes. And I said, okay, I'm going to pray out loud because we both need it. And she said, okay. <laughs> so I'm just praying out loud and God, my goal is peace. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I mean, there's hospitals all around. It's not like I know which hospital or, you know, and then my mind is starting to swarm with emergency rooms and how they're always packed and you can never get a spot and she might have to wait hours. And, you know, my mind keeps doing that, but I just said, I, I have to keep praying out loud. And I said, God, I'm listening to you. I need to know what to do. I need to know how to do it. Tell me where to go. I didn't know what would happen. I was just asking. You know? So all of a sudden I actually got a picture in my mind and I don't get that very often. I mean, I could almost count those on two hands. The times I've actually been given a picture of something for guidance. I just want you to know it's not because I'm special. He, when he needs to give you something, he will. So I got this picture of a two-story white building, which I recognized as it's called Chapman Medical Center. But honestly, when that picture came in my mind, I was already shooting it down because I thought, I think that's a doctor's office. You know, I mean, I really didn't even know if it was a hospital. It's pretty low key. You know, it's two stories. It's not a big high rise hospital. So I was already kind of challenging what I was seeing in my mind, but I knew where it was. That's the picture I got. Rushed her over there and got her a wheelchair to get her out of the car. And, and I said, let me run in and make sure that this is the right place. And I'm kind of leaving her right there at the entrance. And I run over and the doors open and there's nobody in there except this nice lady behind a counter. And I said, I have an emergency. I go, are you open? Because <laughs> there was nobody there. And she said, yes, we're open. How can I help? I said, well, I have an, a medical emergency. Is, is this an okay place to bring her? You know? And she said, yes, bring her in. What happened? And I told her and she signed us in right away. I mean, within 
five minutes, she was on a slab in the examining room being looked at by a doctor. And the woman at the front, while we're waiting that five minutes, she said, you know, you're really in luck today. And I said, oh, what do you mean? And she said, well, one day a month, we have a doctor, a cosmetic surgeon from Beverly Hills. He comes down and donates his time. So we called him. He's already on his way here. And they hadn't even seen her yet. And I'm just like, wow. Well, I didn't know exactly what needed to happen, but I thought, you know, a cosmetic surgeon to put a thumb back together. That sounds pretty good, right? So he did. He came. He was wonderful. Uh, she went straight into surgery. You know, it just couldn't have been faster. I've never seen anything so fast. It was like God said, here's a hospital. We're going to clear everybody out of the way. And it's just for you guys. That's what it felt like. And she went right into surgery. And it was uh, very much the tip of her thumb and like half the nail, I believe. And um, he put it back together. And to this day, you can't really tell them apart. Like she got her nail back. Everything came back. And I knew I had been helped. There was no question in my mind. And I just knew nothing. And of course, if you were wondering, yes, her medical cards worked at that hospital. I really didn't know. And I didn't take time to check. I just wanted to get her someplace as soon as possible. But it really helped to build my trust in God. I was so overwhelmed and I was so sure that I didn't have this answer. And like I say, I think that's a little bit easier when you know you don't have the answer. You're a much better listener. So I was just listening to anything and everything. And he gave me that picture. And I'm like, we're going. I know where that is. I don't understand it, but I'm going. Now, sometimes he says he will give you information that you won't understand, just like I didn't really understand the picture, but it was the right place. And when God gives you an answer, it's going to be complete. So let's say you get part of an answer and you feel good about it and it's looking good, but you're starting to doubt the rest of it. Sometimes I say things to myself that I don't know if I would say to you, but I used to tell myself, God doesn't do half-assed plans. You know, that's probably not very nice here on a church service, but that's what I would tell myself is that God is going to see this through all the way. And my part is step back, let him show me the finish not just the beginning. He's not going to begin to show me something and then drop me on my head. You know, he's going to show us the whole thing, which he does every time. I think it's so important to know that God loves you. If you're not feeling supported, you're not feeling heard, then I feel like every problem we have is rooted in an identity problem. If you have a problem and you feel like it's not being solved, you're not being heard, you're not being answered. And this is not to put it back on your shoulders, but we must understand that we must have forgotten who we are. And that happens a lot. And the temptation is there. So if you are in that situation where you feel like there is no answer, you're not being heard, you don't know what to do, spend a day reminding yourself who you are not trying to solve the problem, who you are. I am the holy child of God. I am as God created me. I am the one God loves. I am safe. I am eternal spirit. I am one with God. And it's not about you getting it so solid in your mind that you come up with some great answer. It's that we have to acknowledge who we are to receive the answer from our higher wisdom. Because if I decide I am not the holy child of God, that I am a body that is vulnerable, that can be lacking, that is broke or broken or confused, or I don't have what I need, or I'm not supported, or life is unfair. What I have just done is I have just validated, let's say the illusion is over here. And let's say the truth is over here because we cannot engage both at the same time. So when I engage the illusion, here's the problem. I'm not engaging anything that's real, but when I engage the illusion of who I am made up me, that's what I call it. When I choose to validate made up me, then my ego, the one I created becomes my guide and my ego doesn't love me 
My ego doesn't want me happy, at peace, successful, feeling good, knowing the joy of my creator. So we must remember that the illusion doesn't offer us anything. So it's okay to focus on illusions, but the problem is you're going to abandon your teacher of peace and you're going to engage your teacher of pain being the ego. And then you're going to have an outcome based on the guide that you have chosen to listen to. So even though when I'm driving that car, Jean is there with me, we're both screaming and crying to tell you the truth. We're just both a mess. We didn't have to have it together. What do we have to do? We had to call in the one that has this answer. Now, I spend quite a bit of time, even up to that point, acknowledging who I am. Fortunately, I was raised in a home where I was taught. I was the child of God, always taught that. So that was an easier one for me. And if you weren't taught that, you might need to remind yourself more frequently than I did. I'm, I'm blessed to have been taught I'm a child of God, but I'm telling you now, so accept my blessing. You are the child of God. You have help call in your help, but you have to lay down being the answer person, the one with the solution. Like I say, a, a, an emergency is almost easier because you know, you don't have the answer and you're all ears and you're listening, right? So if you're not feeling heard, supported, provided for, you spend a day acknowledging who you are and who everybody else is. If you feel like your problem is being caused by this other person, they're withholding from you or they're causing this to happen, or they're the ones that made you sick, or they're the ones that are keeping you from the answer that you want to have. We have to know who they are because as the children of God, we can only be blessed. So we have to be determined to see them for who they really are. You know, our eyes are always showing us what we believe to be true in the place of truth. So if you're seeing someone be irresponsible or unfair or dark or evil or withholding from you, all they're doing is acting out your belief system that these things are possible. And they're showing you what needs to be healed. That's why A Course in Miracles says we actually owe them gratitude. And it's like, gratitude. <laughs> they're the ones causing all my problems, but they're the ones showing you all your problems because the problems are in our mind. And those people out there that are triggering you and causing you to be frustrated and upset, they're showing you the root, which is in your mind of the belief that now you can turn over, give it to God and ask for the healing of that belief. Now, as your mind is healed by the Holy Spirit, your eyes are going to report that healing to you. Your eyes are reporting. They're not seeing. All seeing is done by the divine through you as you, one with you. Seeing is based on knowledge. But what our eyes see, that is a reporting of what we believe to be true. And most of the time that is blocking the truth. So even in the midst of what we see with our eyes, we have to pause and choose again. And that's what it means. So even though I didn't know where to go, even though I didn't know what to do, even though I was completely over my head, I had to choose peace. That was very important. It's important because if I'm looking for the answer to my illusion, guess what I inherit? My ego is my guide because when I'm focused on the illusion, either a good illusion or a bad illusion, or I'm asking for a good illusion to fix my bad illusion, the bigger problem is who I just invited into my room to tell me what to do, right? So I don't want the ego to be my guide. So if I pull up my engagement of the problem, cast it over here on the peace, and I say my goal is peace for everyone involved, now I can open my mind to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. And I was given a picture and I was told what to do. He sent in the right doctor that just happened to be free. You know, we never got a bill for that, that part about the cosmetic surgeon from Beverly Hills. And, you know, that's pretty cool. You'll also see with God that things will be corrected to where it almost looks like nothing happened. You know, that was a pretty 
intense situation for her to have just perfect thumbs, you know? Uh, so I have to forgive the administrative staff, which I did because I really felt that they put me in a situation that they shouldn't have. But I realized while I, while she was in surgery, I needed to forgive them too, because if I kept that judgment about them and why didn't they call an ambulance that knew what to do and where to go. And, and they didn't put me through that hardship that if I held that judgment, which would mean that they are guilty, guilt brings some form of consequence or punishment. So my little girl, not having what she needed or things not turning out so well, that could easily be a consequence of their guilt for not doing the right thing. So I had to forgive them so that all those consequences could be cleared away. We don't need those consequences. We just need God's help now and the solution that God would bring. We don't want to be right about guilt. We don't want to be right about sin. We don't want to be right about error. We want to just go straight to God and say, God, I want only what you would have us have. Make sense? Here's a few reminders. So you tell yourself right away, I am not the one with the answer. And that's true in every single circumstance. So not just the tough ones, but even if you're in the grocery store and you're looking for, what was I looking for the other day? Oh, I was just looking for two little pouches. It's just something we keep in our car for coins and all that kind of thing. And ours was missing. And didn't really have much in it. So it didn't really matter that much and didn't know what happened with all of it. So I was going after two more pouches and I had one in my head that I kind of thought was cute. You know, silly things, right? I'm in a staple store <laughs> and I walk in. And the first thing I said is, God, you know, I'm shopping for these couple of these pouches here. You know, can you show me some good ones? You know, and I just do that. I go shopping with God all the time. And so I'm looking around and, and because school supplies are everywhere, there's pouches out the wazoo, you know, there's pouches here, pouches there, pencil pouches, but they're all really big. And I just wanted something simple coins for the door of the car. So I look all around and I just felt like, keep walking, keep walking. And I, there, you know, and a lot of things were sold out because everybody got their supplies already. And I, I just decided to check with God one more time. I said, so, you know, maybe they're sold out. That's okay. Is there something else that you would have me look at or find? And I was guided to go down another aisle and then a second aisle that I never go down. And right on the shelf are two exact pouches, two just by themselves, sitting in a place where they don't belong. And they're sitting there, you know, in an area that they shouldn't be. They're exactly, exactly what I was looking for and on sale, of course. God is love. Whether it's pouches or what do I do to get this thumb put back on? God is love. It doesn't matter what we ask for or where we need help. So try to come to that place of surrender. Say to yourself, I am not the one with this answer. I cannot be the one with this answer because your ego will keep trying to tell you that you have this answer and you should know, and you should work harder or you should think smarter. No, because all we know basically is the past. And if you don't like how it went before, why would you use that to guide you in the future? Remind yourself that you work for God. I do this a lot. If I'm ever tempted to be frustrated, you know, even if I was still a CFO and say somebody gave me a project when the due date was too short and it felt unfair, then what I would quickly do today is I would remind myself, God, I work for you. I'll do anything and everything you ask me to do. There's nothing I will not do. And I'll tell you what will happen. All of a sudden, somebody will walk in and say, you know, that deadline we had, it's off now because, you know, something, something happened. When you work for God, you will never suffer. You will never be stressed. You will never be burdened. So whatever your job is, even if it's at home, taking care of your sweet babies or your sweet fur babies, or you're just taking care of your elderly mother or yourself, we work for God. The more you remember that, I, I don't mean that in a controlling slavery kind of way. I just mean there's a plan and we're all part of that plan. And we all have a purpose within that plan. 
whatever you're doing, whoever you are, however you're doing it, you're an essential part of this plan. So really we are here to help with that plan. It really helps you to stay out of resentment, frustration, just, I work for God, God, will do whatever you ask me to do. And the moment you give it that surrender and you go with a joyful, happy heart into whatever you're being asked to do, it doesn't mean do ridiculous things. You know, if somebody said, well, I want you to rob a bank, you know, of course not. But I'm just talking about those things that happen in your daily life that you may not be so excited about. <laughs> you know, somebody wants you to come over and I don't know, help them move or, <laughs> but it's a close person, you know, and you're like, Oh, you know, okay, I guess, you know, but let God know you'll do whatever you're asked to do and watch how the burden just gets lifted away. If you're either it's somebody comes in to help or the part you're doing is something you actually enjoy or something you're really good at, it's going to shift and change and meet you where you are. I call this pull your oars in. So oars in means you're kind of in this boat and maybe you're out in the ocean paddling around and you don't know where to go. You're trying to find land, trying to find safety and you're paddling and paddling, spinning in circles, going here, going there. You don't know. You can't see the land. You don't know where to go. Put your oars in your mind, in your boat, oars in. You're going to feel vulnerable. At least when you're paddling around, it feels like you're doing something or you're part of the answer, but you're going to have to get over that. You're not part of the answer. Pull your oars in, in your mind. Say, God, you guide my boat. And I, maybe I haven't trusted you that much before, but what I'm going to try to do is be in my boat, my oars inside, and I'm just going to relax. And will you guide my boat? And you know, I'm just using a little metaphor there, but oars in, let God guide you. But it has to be to that degree that at least for a few minutes, you're letting go of solving your problem. You have to give him floor time with your mind. Remember who you are and who everyone else is. We talked about that. If, if you're feeling unsupported, unanswered, spend at least a day just blessing everyone with who they are in your mind, like holy child of God, behold, the holy child of God. Look, there's the holy child of God that they cannot be sick. They cannot be lacking. They cannot be hurt. They cannot be broken. Dear God, help me to see they cannot even be in death. You know, if somebody died, you just pause. God, thank you that there is no death. You created eternal life and that's all there is. So I'm calling on my loved one right now to take their place in heaven and, you know, keep that line open for all of us here that we could, you know, really benefit from what they can see at this point. There is no death. Refuse to decide against yourself, others, and or your own happy outcome. You might want to put a star next to that one. That one is one of the hardest ones to remember to do. You know, let's say you're, you know, stuck out in the desert and you're lost and it's hot and you're thirsty and you're hungry and you have no idea where you are. Somehow you just ended up in this ridiculous situation. But imagine that your job is pretty simple. You're going to set your goal of peace. You're going to say, God, you decide about how this goes. And you don't have to give him a list. He knows what to do. You decide how this goes. That's fine. You can do that. The part where you're going to have trouble is you're going to be tempted to decide against yourself. You're going to be tempted to think, well, I'm going to die or I'm going to run out, or I'm going to suffer. I think that's a big fear. I'm going to suffer. You're going to have to go back and remind yourself. If you're out in the desert, you have plenty of time to remind yourself. I am the holy child of God. It is not the will of God that I suffer. Therefore, it is not my will. So God, if you're not sure what to do or what to think, you have a default. I call it a workaround. You're going to say, God, you decide for me about how this goes. 
you choose that and you, if you need to hear yourself say it, you choose a happy, peaceful, remarkable outcome for me. And I will let you by the way, right now, God would not choose anything less, but sometimes we have to hear ourselves say that that's okay. Thank you in advance that I am in good hands and that I have nothing to fear. If there's anything that you need me to do or say, or go, or, you know, anything you would have me do, I'm listening, but I'm going to assume that you're handling this. You know, I remember hearing a story once of a lady, she was lost in the desert, I think for 18 days, which I don't even know how you could be in the desert for 18 days. She got lost on a tour, I think out by the Grand Canyon, and she was just out there for a long time. And she kept finding water in really weird places. So she did find some water. But it wasn't until maybe the last day before she was found, she was pretty done in. She was tired and thirsty and hungry. And she finally prayed. It took her like 17 days. And sometimes it does because people don't even know that's an option, you know? But she finally said, and she never had believed in God, but she said, God, if, if there is a God and, and you're listening, I could really use your help. And then all of a sudden, you know, here comes a group of Indians, actually, from their reservation. They were just going on through to do something, and they found her. And, they, and she wasn't very far from their reservation, but they took her and she got well. But I notice with these stories that it's when we pray that the action starts. So pray early. Pray the moment you've got a situation. Pray the moment you need guidance. Pray early. Why wait for heaven? That's what A Course in Miracles says. So as we set our goal of peace, no matter what your problem is, if your daughter is sick with the flu, set your goal of peace. Your temptation is to pray to God to heal your daughter. I understand. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that prayer, except what you're doing is you're saying this sickness is real. And I need God to kind of triumph over this sickness and God can and will. But when we do that, what we're doing is we're saying the sickness has power. And I'm going to call in the power of God and just see if the power of God can take over that power. It's going to be easier for you if first you acknowledge for yourself who she is. She's the holy child of God. Who am I? I'm the holy child of God. God did not create sickness. You could tell yourself that sickness is not real. It has no power. It has no effects of its own. And I will not assign effects to what has no effects. And I am going to choose to see my daughter healed, whole, happy, and blessed just in my prayer time. It doesn't mean I'm not going to treat her, take her to the doctor, do whatever is in front of you to do that brings your fear down and your peace up. The higher up your peace is within you, the better listener you are. Doesn't that make sense? Like sometimes we're lousy listeners when we're in fear. So whatever you need to do in front of you to do, that's okay. Don't, don't try to not do what brings you peace, peace of mind. That always is a step towards listening to God better. But with your daughter, let's say it's very tempting to say, God, please heal my daughter. I have found it goes a little easier for us, a little quicker. If first we refuse to validate the sickness, again, get treatment, do whatever you need to do that brings your fear down. But we need to offer our prayer time. God, help me to understand that you did not create my daughter to be sick. You did not create her to have the flu, that you created her whole, complete, happy and blessed, perfect in your name, eternal spirit one with you. And in truth, she cannot be sick. I am looking at an old belief that we are a body that can be sick. That's all I'm looking at. And I forgive myself. But will you decide for me about all this? Because I want the truth instead of illusions. 
So all prayer is sacred. All prayer is taking you to God. Don't ever judge your prayers. Just give it the best you've got, especially when you're scared and don't know what to do. But it does help to refuse illusions and shut that door to illusions, not to your daughter, to the illusions, and then open the door in your mind to the truth. And you're going to feel like you get answers more quickly because you you aren't engaging your split mind. A split mind is when you're partially devoted to what's true, but you're partially distracted by what is false. So I call it shutting the back door of your mind. We want to shut that door to illusions the best we can just by saying, God, you did not create this. If it is not your will, it is not mine. I call on you to decide about this situation over here. I want peace for my daughter, for me, for everyone involved. And will you decide for us about all of this? And now you you don't have any thoughts that are in the way of that healing disengage from the problem for a few minutes. I'm not saying forever, but for a few minutes and set your goal of peace. It's hard to set your goal of peace until you have closed that door to the illusion. It's kind of like trying to leave a back door open where there's kind of like soiled water coming underneath. And you're trying to stand at the front door and look at all the sunshine and the light. But, you know, all of a sudden the house is filling up with that soiled water. Let's get that back door closed. And then that front door automatically pops open that goes to the truth. Now that you've set your goal of peace, it's kind of like you're a ship captain and your ship was headed into the storm. You're not the captain. So you have to actually step away from the wheel in your mind, step away from the bridge. I should know all this. My son's a captain, a ship captain. He would say, mom, it's a bridge. Okay. Step away from the bridge (laughs) and you're going to ask God to take that driver's seat for you. Right. But you are in charge of where it's going to go. Now, if you decide that you're trying to fix an illusion, guess who just stepped up to the wheel? Your ego. Captain Ego just stepped up to your wheel. If you want to fix an illusion with an illusion, Captain Ego is your new skipper, right? But if you step back from the wheel and you say, my goal is peace, Captain Holy Spirit, steps in front of the wheel. And then the Holy Spirit is the one to bring you the means to accomplish the goal of peace. So be aware, stepping away from the wheel is important, of course, but we're making room for something or someone. Now, what do you want? Do you want illusions or the truth? Do you want peace or pain? Do you want to focus on what God did not create or what God did create? depending upon what you choose, because you always have the power of choice, then that's who steps up to the wheel to guide you. And that is the one that will determine the outcome you will have. Make sense? You can sit back on the lawn chair, relax. Your skipper has the bridge. Everything's fine. But we absolutely want to have the right person in place, the right being. So let's read a few of these quotes. Let's see. In any situation calling for help, think of it this way. You can do much on behalf of your own healing and that of others. If in a situation calling for help, you think of it this way. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do. Because he who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes. Knowing he goes there with me. I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. I left some pauses there so you could repeat after me. 
really important paragraph. It's a great one to memorize. It doesn't mean you have to walk in the world as a healer, but you really are one <laughs> wherever you go. You are representing another way to think, another way for people to process information that could easily bring them to a much greater outcome. We are here to be truly helpful, even if it's opening a door for someone, picking up something that someone dropped. You know, these are the times we feel that kindness, that bond between us makes life worth living. The mind that plans for itself does not think that it will be provided for unless it plans for itself. The mind engaged in planning for itself is occupied in setting up control of future happenings. It does not think that it will be provided for unless it makes its own provisions. Time becomes a future emphasis to be controlled by learning and experience obtained from past events and previous beliefs. You know, that library of the past. It overlooks the present for it rests on the idea the past has taught enough to let the mind direct its future course. And, you know, just logically speaking, the events of the past do not equip us to know what to do with every future experience. We have help. Try to open your mind, empty it out, see that white blanket that we've talked about before. Give God some time, some room, even if it's just a few seconds or a few minutes. If you don't have time and you're really busy, like I was, he'll still get through. He just gave me a flash of a picture. He will always communicate in a way that makes sense for you. The mind that plans is refusing to allow for change. So before I read this, ask yourself, am I this person that keeps planning and you know, mapping things out and trying to provide for myself and trying to figure out how to fix it or solve it? Am I calling this person? Am I going there? Am I trying to add this or, or get rid of that? The answer might be yes. But what he's offering here today is that if you will stop that just for a few minutes, even because if you stop even for a few minutes, it's like it breaks the grip of your ego on you. And it will never hold you in the same way. So just pause for a little bit and remind yourself, I am not the answer person. I do not know what to do. I cannot know what to do. Like tell yourself that because when we say, I do not know what to do, it sounds like weakness. It sounds like we're missing something and then follow it with, I cannot know what to do until the one who knows tells me what to do. Make room for God to show you something else. The mind that plans is thus refusing to allow for change. What it has learned before becomes the basis for its future goals. Its past experience directs its choice of what will happen. And it does not see that here and now is everything it needs to guarantee a future quite unlike the past without a continuity of any old ideas and sick beliefs. Anticipation plays no part at all for present confidence directs the way. Not your present confidence, God's. You don't even have to have your own. I had no confidence on that day about anything, but I did turn to the one that has that confidence. All we are asked to do is accept our part in God's plan and not deny that we are worthy of it. This whole thing about worthiness, it was one of my last holdouts. <laughs> I don't know why it ran so deep, but there was just something in me that said, I am not worthy of this answer. I am not worthy of God's help. I am not worthy of this working out. Not that I would sit there and tell myself that, but there was this deep feeling that whatever I did, it's not enough. I'm kind of the person off on the side and I must have screwed it up somehow. And, you know, at least I could try to help things to be better, but maybe not resolved. When you are thinking you're not worthy, what I learned 
is that we are actually being arrogant. In A Course in Miracles, it says that's actually arrogance because what we're doing is we're allowing our ego to define who we are and what we have a right to. So our ego is basically saying, okay, so God says he made you perfect, flawless, eternal, whatever, you know, the ego. It's like, no, 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 you are imperfect. You are flawed. You are inadequate. You are powerless. You are everything other than what you think you are and you are not worthy of anything so if you listen to that voice in your mind you didn't do enough you didn't work hard enough you didn't save enough you didn't invest enough you made all the wrong decisions and why should you have a easy wonderful answer you are worthy because you are still as god created you you are worthy because you have never been unworthy. You are worthy because you have no interest in deciding against your true identity any longer. And I think that finally got my attention, this whole thing about worthiness and that it was arrogance to think I wasn't worthy, that I was actually siding with my ego against God. And basically that's an arrogant position Not that God's going to strike us down for it or anything like that. But when we are listening to what our ego has to offer, the worst part of that is we will not hear what God is offering. So it's like self-denial that is leading to our own difficult problems and outcomes. So let's accept that we're worthy, not because we're so great and we did all the right things. We are worthy because we are still as God created us. That's all he's asking you to accept. Let us not fight our function. We did not establish it. It is not our idea. The means are given us by which it will be perfectly accomplished. Did you hear that? The means are given us by which it will be perfectly accomplished. There's nowhere in there that says that I need to be really clear and I need to make really good decisions and I need to do all the right things in order to get this to happen. The means are going to be given you. Breathe that in. You know, the energy is not going out from you like you doing all the efforting. It's really being given to you. Pause and welcome that idea. All that we are asked to do is to accept our part in genuine humility and not deny with self-deceiving arrogance that we are worthy. What is given us to do, we have the strength to do. Our minds are suited perfectly to take the part assigned to us by one who knows us well. There might be times when you think, I just can't call the mortgage company one more time, or I just can't talk to my son about his father and me, or I, you know, things we have to do that we think we cannot do. Ask God to help you, give you the words, set your goal of peace, follow your guide. You can do it and you will, and you'll be great every time. And you'll come away thinking, wow, that went a lot better than I expected. Lay aside all false humility today and listen to God reveal to you what he would have you do. All false humility we lay aside today that we may listen to God's voice reveal to us what he would have us do. We do not doubt our adequacy for the function he will offer us. We will be certain only that he knows our strengths our wisdom, and our holiness. And if he deems us worthy, so we are. It is but arrogance that judges otherwise. If you are deciding today that you are not worthy of what you're asking for, what you're praying about, what you'd like to see happen, do you realize the answer must wait until you change your mind? The answer is still there. And there's nothing that You need to do to bring on that answer other than don't deny yourself. There is only one way to be released from the plan of imprisonment 
that you have made. Hmm, what could that be? There is one way and only one to be released from the imprisonment your plan to prove the false is true has brought to you. Accept the plan you did not make instead. Can you do that? What do you think? Can you do that? Can you accept a plan that you know nothing about? You're not really sure what it is. You don't know what it, I mean, even if God gives you a picture, you may not understand it. Are you willing to lay down your plan, all the details, all those thoughts you have about it, everything you've been trying to do to orchestrate and, and put everything together? Could you put that down for a bit? And be willing to accept a plan and you have no idea what it is. Your ego is going to be saying, oh, you can't do that because God will never give you what you want. And that is false. Nothing further from the truth. Judge not your value to it, meaning the value to the plan. If God's voice assures you that salvation needs your part and that the whole depends on you, be sure that it is so. The arrogant must cling to words, afraid to go beyond them to experience which might affront their stance. Yet are the humble free to hear the voice which tells them what they are and what to do. So if you're listening to your ego, remember, and you're thinking, I'm not worthy, I don't know if I should have this answer then we're standing in arrogance. And he says, when you're in that arrogant position, you're not going to hear him. But if you'll stand in humility and say, I am worthy because God created me as worthy and I have a right to happiness. It is his will that I am happy. Now you are open to hearing his voice. The voice for God assures you that you have the strength and wisdom to go beyond all images, like everything you see that says, I can't go past that. I can't get there. Yes, you can. Arrogance makes an image of yourself that is not real. So if you're thinking of yourself as lazy or unmotivated or uneducated, not smart, don't have what it takes. Everybody else has that, but you don't have that. Try to tell yourself it's an arrogant position. Because, I mean, it's almost like you're like guilting yourself out of guilt. <laughs> so try to do it with some humor. But if you believe that you don't have the genes, let's say that everybody else has, you are listening to your ego. The ego is your God at the moment. You are worshiping that God by listening to it. And by listening to it, you are standing in arrogance before your God, the true God. Try to tell yourself these little pep talks, not to make yourself feel bad, but to understand that it doesn't serve you at all to see yourself as unworthy or flawed, imperfect, not enough. Because as long as you do that, the ego will be your guide and the Holy Spirit will have to wait until you're willing to see that differently. You must agree with him about who you are. You may not fully understand it, but you have to want to understand and choose to agree. So arrogance makes an image of yourself that is not real. It is this image which quails and retreats in terror as the voice for God assures you that you have the strength, the wisdom, and the holiness to go beyond all images. You are not weak, as is the image of yourself. You are not ignorant and helpless. Sin cannot tarnish the truth in you, and misery can come not near the holy home of God. But we've got to claim that home within us. We are the holy home of God. God's voice is certain of its messages. In lovely contrast, certain as the sun's return each morning to dispel the night, your truly given function stands out clear and wholly unambiguous. There is no doubt of its validity. It comes from one who knows no error, and his voice is certain of its messages. They will not change nor be in conflict. All of them point to one goal and one you can attain. 
Your plan may be impossible, but God's can never fail because he is its source. Do as God's voice directs, even if it seems impossible. Do as God's voice directs, and if it asks a thing of you which seems impossible, remember who it is that asks and who would make denial. Only the ego part of our mind would deny what God is asking us to do. Then consider this, which is more likely to be right? The voice that speaks for the creator of all things, who knows all things exactly as they are, or a distorted image of yourself, confused, bewildered, inconsistent, and unsure of everything. Let not its voice direct you, your ego's voice. Hear instead a certain voice which tells you of a function given you by your creator who remembers you and urges that you now remember him. Now, some people get a little offended because they hear things like you're confused. You don't know what you're doing. You know, you're in fear. It's not you that is confused. It's made up you that is confused. It's projected you that doesn't know what to do. It's this version of yourself that you're seeing as helpless or inadequate or powerless or lazy or unmotivated. That is your made up self. And you're, it's your made up self, not you. It's like if I made up myself up and I'm imagining that's who I am, that made up version of me is the one that is being arrogant. That made up version of me is the one in self-denial. So we want to go back and realign with that which we are. And then we get to receive the gifts and blessings that come with our true self and all that our creator has already given. His gentle voice is calling to you with comfort, restitution, and gifts to answer your every need. Breathe that in. His gentle voice is calling from the known to the unknowing. He would comfort you, although he knows no sorrow. He would make a restitution, though he is complete. A gift to you, although he knows that you have everything already. He has thoughts which answer every need his son perceives, although he sees them not. For love must give. And what is given in his name takes on the form most useful in a world of form. I want you to hear the love in that statement. Imagine that you have a child and you know this child has everything because you gave it to them. They have everything, but they believe they don't. And so they're sad. They're frustrated. They're worried. They're scared. And so you give them what they think they're lacking. You offer them restitution, even though they don't really need it. They already have everything. And you offer them whatever they need just because they think they need it. That's love. It really is. Because you're overlooking yourself, what you've done, all the great things you've offered. And out of love, you're just meeting them where they are. You know, if you had a a little child and they woke up in the night and they said, you know, mommy, daddy, there's a, there's somebody in my closet. You know, I heard a sound. Well, you're not probably going to say, oh, go back to sleep. You're silly. You know, go back to bed out of love. I think you would probably go in their room, turn on the light. You would go over to the closet. You know, there's nobody in their closet. At least you hope you hope there's nobody in their closet, but you turn on the light and you might sit with them in, in their closet if you need to, to show them it's safe in there. You might hold their hand. You might tell them a funny story. You know, there's no monster in the closet, but out of love, you're going to sit with them and you're going to give them answers that make sense to them. Know that God loves you that much. He's going to give you answers that make sense to you. But you must remember who you are. 
Because if you have decided you're not what God created, that you are this made up version that's messed up, you're going to deny what is yours. It's almost like you have a great big trust fund with your name on it and you need money, let's say, or you need resources and you've got this great big trust fund and it's got your name on it, but you don't remember who you are. You go to the bank and they say, how can I help? And you say, well, I want to draw on that trust fund. And they say, who are you? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> they say, well, maybe you can come back tomorrow. We have to know who we are. Then we receive the blessings that have already been given. There's no gap. In A Course in Miracles, it teaches us that what God gave has already been given. He's not holding out on us. If we are experiencing lack or delay or sickness or sorrow or pain or suffering, somewhere in our mind, we said yes to what we are not. And we need to spend a day really focused on who we are and who everybody else is. He says, imagine what I can give to you when you see me in everyone. So this next one here is one of my favorites. It says, a healed mind does not plan. A healed mind does not plan. It carries out the plans that it receives through listening to wisdom that is not its own. It waits until it has been taught what should be done and then proceeds to do it. It does not depend upon itself for anything except its adequacy to fulfill the plans assigned to it. It is secure in certainty that obstacles cannot impede its progress to accomplishment of any goal that serves the greater plan established for the good of everyone. God established that greater plan for the good of everyone. All he's asking us to do is remember who we are, who everybody else is, be willing to know we can do whatever he asks us to do because he's going to give us the resources or whatever we need to do that and to allow God to give us the guidance to walk through our situation, come to find out that we are back at peace and we are safe and we have nothing to fear. Your present trust in God promises a future without sorrow and joy that constantly increases. Your present trust in God is the defense that promises a future undisturbed, without a trace of sorrow, and with joy that constantly increases as this life becomes a holy instant set in time, but heeding only immortality. Let no defenses but your present trust direct the future and this life becomes a meaningful encounter with the truth that only your defenses would conceal. So he's teaching us that we're constantly defending against who we are and who everybody else is. And so what we can do instead is get back on our own team, choose to remember who we are, accept it with a willingness to accept it. It doesn't mean you have it all sorted out. I finished with a little prayer here to calm your mind. Think about whatever challenge you are facing today. It might be more than one. You put them in a little, a little basket in your mind. Now let's look at that basket and bring it to God together. Dear God, I am facing something very challenging and I am tempted to go into more worry and fear. My goal is the highest level of peace, and I wholly dedicate this entire situation to the light of truth, where peace is inevitable. Thank you for teaching me that when I am worried, you are not. When I am uncertain about my future, you are certain. When I am confused about what to do, you are very clear and will tell me exactly what to do. 
if I will pause and listen. I wholly give you this entire situation, and my goal is the highest, happiest, and most remarkable outcome for everyone involved. Thank you in advance for deciding for me about every single detail of this situation and for guiding me about what to do, when to do it, what to say, and when to say it, as this will ensure a peaceful outcome. I am learning that I am not the one with the answers and that I must step back and welcome the one who has every answer in relief, gratitude, and humility. I gladly step back and ask you to lead the way. I will follow only your voice to the best of my ability, and I will not decide against you or myself, my life, my future, other people, or the happy outcome that you have for me. I am willing to trust you with my whole heart. I am also determined to trust that everyone will play their roles perfectly according to your plan on our behalf. In your name and by your authority, I am as you created me. As the holy child of God, I am forever safe, secure, blessed, and provided for, and loss of any kind is impossible. Thank you for teaching me that as I follow your guidance, a happy outcome to all things is sure. May your will be done. Amen. Go ahead and take a nice, deep, relaxing breath. Today, I'd love to finish with a little guided meditation. Take in another deep, relaxing breath. Our meditation today is called Making Room for God's Answer. Go ahead and close your eyes. Feel the relief of the prayer that we just shared together that we are stepping back, we are making room for God. Take another deep, relaxing breath. It does not take time. It's a choice, a choice to step back and say, God, I am making room for you. I am giving you this problem, whatever it is, no matter how long it's been going on, no matter how frequent it seems to be, no matter how grim it seems to look, you may have no idea of an answer, any answer. You may think you are out of answers, but God is not. Feel the peace of this. God is not out of answers. He has every resource available to him. He is all knowing, all wise, all loving, eternal, principle, mind, soul, spirit, life, truth, and love, and the creator of all in all, the great I am. He is simply asking you to remember him. Remember that He created you. Remember that He loves you. Remember that you have every reason to feel calm. He's got you. 
Today we make room for God. We take a moment to inventory whatever it is we are dealing with, all the complexity, the people involved, however big or powerful it seems to be. And just for a few moments, we are going to lay it down in our mind. Just imagine setting it down and stepping away from it for a few minutes. We are making room for God. And this includes that we would lay down every preconceived notion about how we think it should be solved. Maybe we think someone else has this answer. Maybe we are waiting for a deal to close or a customer to make a purchase. Maybe we are waiting for something in the illusion to be our answer. Would we be willing to lay that down for a moment and simply let it not be the answer for a few minutes? What if there's another answer? The likelihood is great because God has every answer available to him. Every God solution I have ever gotten, as far as I can remember, was never one I expected the way that I expected it. Be okay with that. If God gave you an answer and it does bring peace to the situation, does it matter what that answer is? What if the problem is supposed to dissolve? What if the problem is no longer a problem? What if the answer is coming from some place you have never considered? What if someone is going to call you with an answer, but that call has not yet been made? Maybe it's coming in 47 minutes. Let God show you what to do. Remind yourself, you are looking at illusions. It doesn't make it easier sometimes, but it does help you understand that what you are looking at has no power. And it helps you understand that what does have power has just been invited to intervene. If you decide that the problem does have power to hurt you, take from you, rob you of something, then power has been assigned to the illusion. He is teaching us that there's only one power, the power of God, and it runs through all of us. If we decide that power is now outside of us and it's in that problem or that person over there, we will feel powerless. And this is a lie. There is only one power. And what is not of God has no power to do anything. Refuse your illusion in your prayer for a few minutes. Remind yourself, I am not looking at the truth. 
I am looking at the effects of my old belief system. That is all. And I forgive myself. We are all here for the healing of our mind or we wouldn't be here. We'd be right at home where we have no problems. But somewhere in time, we said yes, that we could be something other than what God created us to be. And now we have help in the Holy Spirit to lead us back to what is true, what is real, to our safety, to a place where loss is impossible, not even conceived of, and where we know our oneness with God. Be an ally on your own team. Decide with God that you are the holy child that he loves that you are the perfect, precious one that he created. Not the body, you are eternal spirit forever. Nothing to fear, no opposition, created to be happy, to know his love in everything you do. If you are holding any judgments against yourself for the past, pause. Be determined to forgive yourself. This need not be. No one is going to judge you for it. Lay it down. Imagine walking under a golden shower of light and wash yourself clean. Be done with it. You are as God created you. You have never been less. You have never been outside of his love. Breathe it in. We lay out that beautiful white blanket in our mind. You might imagine sitting there right in the middle or getting a nice chair top of the blanket. Find yourself a comfortable place and let God know that this is your time with him. You are listening, not for illusions or answers to your illusions. You are just listening without agenda. He assures us that what we hear will solve the problem as we see it. Do not worry. But what we hear is very likely to be what we don't expect. So we have to listen without agenda. He told me once, if I give you the recipe for lemon cake, then I want you to write it down. That just means listen. No matter what I tell you, just listen and hear what I have to say. And so I've tried to listen that way and for good reason, because most of the time when you receive guidance, it's always something you don't expect because it's coming from an infinite realm of possibilities to draw from. Or someone calls me that I didn't expect, maybe haven't talked to in years. And there they are with the answer. Dear God, we trust you. We may not know how, we may be lousy at it, but we want to trust you. We're learning to trust you. You are teaching us that trust is developed. It's not innate. We are going to draw from all the successes we have had thus far. We are going to reinforce our trust and say, maybe if God helped me once, he could certainly help me again. Breathe it in. 
God, we are willing to trust you instead of doubt you. We are willing to let you guide us instead of trying to do this ourselves. We are willing to know that as you lead us, we will have no problems. You did not create problems for us to have. You did not create lack. Lack is not real. You did not create sickness. It is not real. You did not create loneliness or suffering. They are not real. We are experiencing them because we had been holding a place in our mind where we had accepted that we are a body that can have these challenges. We are willing to see this differently. We are the holy children of God. We receive your blessings. Everything that you have given, we are worthy because you created us as worthy. We are loved and we are safe. And you are the source of everything. And we cannot be without what we need. We are willing to see everything differently and see only the light in every other person, regardless of their behaviors, their actions, their words, their personality. You created your children to bless and be blessed. We accept what you created and that which you love as true real our true identity may your will be done we have no decision against you thank you in advance for the highest happiest and most remarkable outcome for everyone involved and beyond May your will be done. Amen. All right, everyone. Thank you for being here today. It's been so much fun to share this message about going to God and making sure you're stepping back, letting that guidance come to you. I love you all so much. I hope you'll join me in the Miracle Cafe. We will be back in about five minutes. Take a little break. And I'll see you there. You can ask questions, prayer requests, anything you need. I'll see what I can do to help. We have a perfect guide guiding us. So let's have some fun. See you soon. <laughs>